After Barclay's forces united with Bagration at Smolensk they attacked the incoming French army that marched unstoppable. Barclay's attempt to destroy them at Vitebsk had failed and Bagration was defeated by Davout at Saltanovka. After the Russian defeat at Smolensk, the unpopular Barclay was replaced by an older Russian general who had more knowledge, named Kutuzov that also fought Napoleon at Austerlitz and knew his strategies. The Russian general, Wittgenstein, got defeated by St. Cyr and Adeno at the First Battle of Polotsk and was forced to retreat north. Bagration wanted to organize militia, as Barclay had led the French right into Moscow. Political pressure on Barclay to give battle and the general's continuing reluctance to do so led to his removal after the defeat at Smolensk. On 20 August, he was replaced from his position as commander-in-chief by the popular veteran Mikhail Kutuzov. The former head of the St. Petersburg militia of the State Council arrived on the 29th at Zaryovo Zymish, a border village. The weather was still unbearably hot, and Kutuzov went on with Barclay's successful strategy, using attrition warfare instead of risking the army in an open battle. Napoleon's superiority in numbers was almost eliminated from a ratio of 3 to 1 to a merely 5 to 4. The Russians fell back even deeper into Russia's interior as he continued to move east. They took a defensive position near Moscow to not let the historic city into French hands. The initial Russian position, which stretched south of the new Smolensk Highway, Napoleon's expected route of advance was anchored on its left by a pentagonal earthwork redoubt on a mound near the village of Shevardino. The Russian generals soon realized that their left wing was too exposed and vulnerable so the Russian line was moved back from this position, but the redoubt remained manned, Kutuzov stating that the fortification was manned simply to delay the French forces. Historian Dmitry Budelin reports that it was used as an observation point to determine the course of the French advance. Other historians reported it as it was used as a fortification to threaten the French right flank, despite being beyond the effective reach of guns of the period. The chief of staff of the Russian First Army, Alexei Yermolov, related in his memoirs the Russian left was shifting positions when the French army arrived sooner than expected. Thus the Battle of Shevardino became a delaying effort to shield the redeployment of the Russian left. The construction of the redoubt and its purpose is disputed till this day. On September 5th Murat's cavalry met the Russian cavalry in a massive clash, the Russians eventually retreating and their flank was threatened. The fighting resumed the next day but the Russian again retreated after reinforcement from Boanes 4th Corps. The Russians retreated to Shevardino Redoubt, where a pitched battle ensued. Murat led 1st and 2nd Cavalry Corps, supported by Davout's 1st Infantry Division. Prince Poniatowski's Polish Infantry Division attacked the position from south. Fighting was heavy and very fierce as the Russians refused to retreat until Kutuzov personal order. The French captured the redoubt at a cost of 4,000 French and 6,000 Russian casualties. The unexpected French advance from the west and the fall of Shevardino redoubt threw the Russian formations into disarray. Since the left flank had collapsed, Russian forces withdrew east, constructing a makeshift position centered around the village of Utitsa. According to the Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz, although the Russian left was on marginally higher ground, this was but a superficial matter and did not provide much of a defensive advantage. The positioning of the Russian right was such for the French the left seemed an obvious choice. The Russian position at Borodino consisted of a disconnected earthworks running in an arc from the Moskva River on the right, along its tributary, the Koloka, whose steep banks added to the defense. Thick woods interspersed along the Russian left and center made the deployment and control of French forces difficult, aiding the defenders. The Russian center was defended by Ravsky Redoubt, a massive open backed earthwork mounting 1912 pounder cannons, which had a clear field of fire, all the way to Koloka. Kutuzov was very concerned that the French might take the new Smolensk road around his positions and onto Moscow, so placed the more powerful First Army under Barclay on the right, in positions which were already strong and virtually unassailable by the French. 
The second army under Bagration was expected to hold the left. The fall of Shevardino unanchored the Russian left flank, but Kutuzov did nothing to change these initial dispositions, despite the repeated pleas of his generals to redeploy their forces. Thus, when the action began and became a defensive rather than an offensive battle for the Russians, their heavy preponderance in artillery was wasted on a right wing that would never be attacked. While the French artillery did much to help win the battle, Colonel Karl Wilhelm von Toll and others would make attempts to cover up their mistakes in this deployment, and later attempts by historians would compound the issue. Indeed, Clausewitz also complained about Toll's dispositions being so narrow and deep that needless losses were incurred from artillery fire. The Russian position, therefore, was just about 8 kilometers long, with about 80,000 of the 1st Army on the right and 34,000 of the 2nd Army on the left. The first area of operations was on the Bagration Fletchers, as had been predicted by both Barclay de Tolly and Bagration. Napoleon, in command of the French forces, made errors similar to those of his Russian adversary, deploying his forces inefficiently and failing to exploit the weaknesses in the Russian line. Despite Marshal Davout's suggestion of a manoeuvre to outflank the weak Russian left, the Emperor instead ordered Davout's first cause to move directly forward into the teeth of the defence, while the flanking manoeuvre was left to the weak 5th cause of Prince Poniatowski. The initial French attack was aimed at seizing the three Russian positions collectively known as the Bagration Fletchers, three arrowhead shaped, open backed earthworks which arced out to the left and echelon in front of the Kaloka stream. These positions helped support the Russian left, which had no terrain advantages. There was much to be desired in the construction of the Fletchers, one officer noting that the ditches were much too shallow, the embrasures open to the ground, making them easy to enter and that they were much too wide, exposing infantry inside them. The Fletchers were supported by artillery from the village of Semyonovskaya, whose elevation dominated the other side of the Kaloka. The battle began at 6 o'clock with the opening of the 102-gun French Grand Battery against the Russian center. Davout sent Kumpens' division against the southernmost of the Fletchers, with Desaic's division placed out to the left. When Kumpens exited the woods on the far bank of the Kaloka, he was hit by massed Russian cannon fire. Both Kumpens and Desais were wounded, but the French continued their assault. Davout, seeing the confusion, personally led the 57th Line Regiment forward until he had his horse shot from under him. He fell so hard that General Sorbia reported him as dead. General Rapp arrived to replace him, only to find Davout alive and leading the 57th Regiment forward again. Rapp then led the 61st Line Regiment forward when he was wounded for the 22nd time in his career. By seven and a half o'clock, Davout had gained control of the three Fletchers. Prince Bagration quickly led a counterattack that threw the French out of the positions, only to have Marshal Mitchell Ney led a charge by the 24th Regiment that retook them. Eight Grenadier battalions and 20 for 12 pounder cannon at their best pace to bolster Semenovsky Colonel Toll and Kutuzov moved the guard reserve units forward as early as nine o'clock. During the confused fighting, French and Russian units moved forward into impenetrable smoke and were smashed by artillery and musketry fire that was horrendous even by Napoleonic standards. Infantry and cavalrymen had difficulty maneuvering over the heaps of corpses and masses of wounded. Murad advanced with his cavalry around the Fletchers to attack Bagration's infantry, but was confronted by General Duca's 2nd Cuirassier Division, supported by Neverovsky's infantry. The French carried out seven assaults against the Fletchers and each time were beaten back in fierce close combat. Bagration in some instances was personally leading counterattacks, and in a final attempt to push the French completely back, he got hit in the leg by cannonball splinters somewhere around 11 o'clock. He insisted on staying on the field to observe Duca's decisive cavalry attack. The Second Army's command structure fell apart as Bagration was removed from the battlefield and the report of his being hit quickly spread and caused morale collapse. Napoleon, who had been sick with a cold and was too far from the action to really observe what was going on, refused to send his subordinates reinforcements. He was hesitant to release his last reserve, the Imperial Guard, so far from France. Prince Eugene Boanes advanced his cause against Borodino, rushing the village and capturing it from the Russian guard Jigas. However, the advancing columns rapidly lost their cohesion. Shortly after clearing Borodino, they faced fresh Russian assault columns and retreated back to the village. 
Kutuz afforded Yermolov to take action. The general brought forward three horse artillery batteries that began to blast the open-ended redoubt, while the 3rd Battalion of the Ufa Regiment and two Jiga regiments brought up by Barclay rushed in with the bayonet to eliminate Bonami's brigade. The Russian reinforcements assault returned the redoubt to Russian control. The UGM's artillery continued to pound Russian support columns, while Marshals Ney and Davout set up a crossfire with artillery positioned on the Semyovskavia Heights. Barclay countered by moving the Prussian general Eugen over to the right to support Miloradovich in his defense of the redoubt. The French responded to this move by sending forward General Sorbia, commander of the Imperial Guard artillery. Sorbia brought forth 36 artillery pieces from the Imperial Guard artillery park and also took command of 49 horse artillery pieces from Nancy's OSD Cavalry Corps and La Tour Mauborg. On the morning of the battle, at around 7.30, Don Cossack patrols from Matvey Pladov's Polk had discovered a ford across the Koloka River on the extreme Russian right northern flank. Seeing that the ground in front of them was clear of enemy forces, Pladov saw an opportunity to go around the French left flank and into the enemy's rear. He at once sent one of his aides to ask for permission from Kutuzov for such an operation. Pladov's aide was lucky enough to encounter Colonel von Toll, an enterprising member of Kutuzov's staff, who suggested that General Uvarov's 1st Cavalry could be added to the operation, and at once volunteered to present the plan to the Commander-in-Chief. Together, they went to see Kutuzov, who nonchalantly gave his permission. There was no clear plan and no objectives had been drawn up, the whole maneuver being interpreted by both Kutuzov and Avarov as a feint. Avarov and Pladov thus set off, having just around 8,000 cavalrymen and 12 guns in total. As Avarov moved southwest and south and Pladov moved west, they eventually arrived in the undefended rear of Viceroy Eugenez for corps. This was towards midday, just as the Viceroy was getting his orders to conduct another assault on the Ravsky Redoubt. The sudden appearance of masses of enemy cavalry so close to the supply train and the Emperor's headquarters caused panic and consternation, prompting EUG Nair to immediately cancel his attack and pull back his entire corps westwards to deal with the alarming situation. Meanwhile, the two Russian cavalry commanders tried to break what French infantry they could find in the vicinity. Having no infantry of their own, the poorly coordinated Russian attacks came to nothing. Unable to achieve much else, Pladov and Avarov moved back to their own lines, and the action was perceived as a failure by both Kutuzov and the Russian general staff. As it turned out, the action had the utmost importance in the outcome of the battle, as it delayed the attack of the four corps. During these two hours, the Russians were able to reassess the situation, realize the terrible state of Bagration's second army and send reinforcements to the front line. Meanwhile, the retreat of Viceroy Eugenez's corps had left Montbrun's two French cavalry corps to fill the gap, which used up and demoralized these cavalrymen, greatly reducing their combat effectiveness. The delay contradicted a military principle the Emperor had stated many times, ground I may recover, time never. The Cossack raid contributed to Napoleon's later decision not to commit his Imperial Guard. At 2 p.m., Napoleon renewed the assault against the redoubt, as Brucia's Morans and Girard's divisions launched a massive frontal attack, with Chastel's Light Cavalry Division on their left and the two Reserve Cavalry Corps on their right. The Russians sent Likachev's 24th Division into the battle, who fought bravely under Likachev's motto, Brothers, behind us is Moscow. But the French troops approached too close for the cannons to fire, and the cannoneers fought a pitched, close order defense against the attackers. General Calling Court ordered Wardier's Cuirassier Division to lead the assault. Barclay saw Eugene as preparations for the assault and attempted to counter it, moving his forces against it. The French artillery, however, began bombarding the assembling force even as it gathered. Calling Court led Wardier's Cuirassiers in an assault on the opening at the back of the redoubt. He was killed as the charge was beaten off by fierce Russian musketry. General Thielman then led eight Saxon and two Polish cavalry squadrons against the back of the redoubt, while officers and sergeants of his command actually forced their horses through the redoubt's embrasures. The battle had all but ended, with both sides so exhausted that only the artillery was still at work. At 15.30, the Ravsky redoubt fell with most of the 24th Division's troops. General Likachov was captured by the French. 
The third area of operations was around the village of Utitsa. The village was at the southern end of the Russian positions and lay along the old Smolensk Road. It was rightly perceived as a potential weak point in the defense, as a march along the road could turn the entire position at Borodino. Despite such concerns, the area was a tangle of rough country, thickly covered in heavy brush, well suited for deploying light infantry. The forest was dense, the ground marshy, and Russian Jaegers were deployed there in some numbers. Russian General Nikolai Tuchkov had some 23,000 troops, but half were untrained a Polchino militia armed only with pikes and axes and not ready for deployment. Tuchkov had deployed his 1st Grenadier Division in line, backing it with the 3rd Division in battalion columns. Some four regiments were called away to help defend the redoubts that were under attack, and another two Jaeger regiments were deployed in the Utitsa woods, weakening the position. The Polish contingent contested control of Utitsa village, capturing it with their first attempt. Tuchkov later ejected the French forces by 8 o'clock. General Jean and Dos Juno led the Westphalians to join the attack and again captured Utitsa, which was set on fire by the departing Russians. After the village's capture, Russians and Poles continued to skirmish and cannonade for the rest of the day without much progress. The heavy undergrowth greatly hindered Poniatowska's efforts, but eventually he came near to cutting off Tuchkov from the rest of the Russian forces. General Barclay sent help in the form of Karl Gustav von Bagavat with Konovnitsyn in support. Any hope of real progress by the Poles was then lost. Towards 15 o'clock, after hours of resistance, the Russian army was in dire straits, and French forces were exhausted and had neither stamina nor will to carry another assault. Borodino represented the last Russian effort to stop the French from reaching Moscow and withdrew the following day. The French wanted a deciding final push that would change the Russian army, but were aware about the fierce resistance. Rapp recommended to the Emperor that the Guard be deployed for action, at which the Emperor replied. I will most definitely not. I do not want to have it blown up. I am certain of winning the battle without its intervention. Determined not to commit this valuable final reserve so far away from France, Napoleon refused such request and ordered the guarding of the battlefield and the unleash of a massive cannonade with 400 guns. 